Joey Diaz talking about loosely talking about Brendan, but also Oslo. Jesus Christ, I'm infected with Shorbanese. So this is Joey Diaz talking about Brendan, but also talking about Lee Sayat in a roundabout way. But I find this interesting because Joey Diaz has kind of been suffering from like, I don't know, some sort of something in terms of when it comes to criticizing Brendan, because in one time he will say some really cutting remarks about Brendan. You know, how flipping, what's her, what's her name? Uh, Missy Shaw would have never passed him at the comedy store if she was still alive. She would never let him on the stage. Um, he has no business being on there. Next time saying he's the greatest guy, the bestest guy. And now he's basically saying that how the reason why he treated Lee the way he did um, in terms of his stand-up career, didn't really try to help him out and give him much of a kind of cosign was because he didn't want him to end up like Brendan Shaw, which is essentially, you know, basically um, talking down on Brendan and his career and saying everything you want to say without saying anything at all or without actually directly addressing it. So this is Joey Diaz. No, from time to time, I have a hard time breathing. He goes, listen, this is anxiety. Let me give you these pills. He gave me those football Xanaxes. So, I don't know. I would take them, one or two, when I felt it, and then leave them at home. I would be out at night, and I would get anxiety. But it, it never bothered me again. After that bout at the store, I'll never forget, I had Rogan that week, and I had to go on Rogan and tell him the story. And as we were leaving, he's like, bro, that sounds crazy. I didn't explain it. I wasn't totally honest with everybody about it, but I blacked out, guys. And after that, my anxiety level started going up. After that Netflix thing, I don't know what happened to me. Something wasn't right. And guess what, guys? I To be fair to Joey Diaz, I know some of you guys are saying he looks vintage and stuff, but he has lost a bunch of weight. And if anything... I believe Joey Diaz's drug stories. I know some people don't believe them and think he's lying all the time, but I think if you legitimately have done the amount of drugs that Joey Diaz did, and if you see pictures of Joey Diaz when he's young, he's actually legitimately handsome. Like he was a good looking dude. Even the way he used to stand was different. He never had the hunchback. Like he was a, he was like an athlete. He used to play basketball and shit. Like he looked actually good back in the day. But if he was doing coke and shit when he was like i don't know 13 or whatever when his mum died and shit and just being around the most sketchiest dodgiest people from day dot it's no surprise he ended up looking the way he does like those things take their toll on you even when you get sober that's why people say probably you should avoid all those things in general or quit as soon as possible because it does catch up on you it doesn't stop something you can kind of run away from um so he's lived a hard life but he's trying to get right now and i feel like he's definitely more right than wrong and i feel like if joey diaz was doing the things he's doing prior you would best be able to tell but this is what happens isn't it? this is kind of the consequences of it um i think he's basically a good cautionary tell in that regard i got up all the way to I was 340 <laughs> yeah. pounds. Yeah, Ambika X. I'm screwed, NB. Yeah, me too. Don't worry, Ambika X. Me too. <laughs> I'm 336. I was smoking God knows how much. I was eating God knows how much. My diet was okay, but my sleeping wasn't good. And when you're not sleeping good, you're not thinking clearly. You know, the sleep apnea wasn't affecting me, but the, the fucking sleeping five hours, having to fly, having to sleep two hours, all that shit wears on your system. I didn't fucking know it. Who knows it? Who fucking knows it? We're fucking gangsters. You know what I'm saying? We don't have time to fucking bleed. And guys, uh, somewhere around that time, I'm like, I got to start eating these fucking Xanaxes. So here I'm eating the Xanaxes. And at the time, I was eating maybe two of that. I was eating one in the morning and one at night. To Jesus Christ, brother. There's a, for several reason, again, I, I know it's probably because of their workload, but the way Xanax took a, grip on that comedy store scene or just comedians in general was wild didn't it it's like they all found this like secret happy drug or something like they all latched onto it so quickly like super fast like they all kind of got hooked on it in their own ways i'm sure some of them silently probably i mean sorry jody has to be fair to him he's only the only one to kind of is honest about it and speaks about it quite frankly even though i think red bar took the piss out of him about it but this really affected people negatively in the comedy scene for a long time xanax man like for a long time people were talking glowingly about it like they discovered this new flipping fruity starburst thing but the effects on xanax and the cryptic and having people is absolutely crazy sleep and they were fine and i'm fucking i'm not drinking on them thank god and i'm smoking weed like a motherfucker i'm taking edibles like a motherfucker i'm eating hash like a motherfucker you know i asked lee the other day i go lee remember those bottles of liquid we were drinking they were 200 milligrams 
We would drink one of those Jesus, just to, when I saw him, they were like an aperitif. Like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> Take a tube. And we would go, not again. And yeah. he'd drink it, you know. And between the Xanax, the edibles, right then and there, 2017 was where I started a drop. Mm. I felt a drop in my connection with Lee was dropping. Lee was starting comedy. And I was very happy for him, but I didn't want him to become a Brendan Schaub, like for people to go after <laughs> Brent. Like I didn't want people to go after Lee, how they went after Brendan. I appreciate what Brendan did. But at the end of the day, a lot of you people are right. He was giving too much too fast. I love Brendan. I'm not saying nothing bad about him. What happened was that, that, that you don't react well to that when you're a young comic. You don't, guys. All that up front of the third or second year is not healthy for anybody. And I looked after Lee, you know, and I, I kept him at home. He went on the road with me some week. The thing that's really annoying about this conversation and people saying this now is that this was the original criticism. I remember when the Fire and the Kids subreddit started popping off and getting where it got to, before it started to get a little bit dark and a little bit vengeful and they started to like troll the, the wife and people were posting pictures of the kids. Now it stopped now. They kind of grained it in. But, you know, it's still a little bit mean spirit, I think, in some respects. I think there's some people on there who generally do want to see Brendan sort of crash and burn and have to work out a fucking Wendy's. But before then, people on the forum were just basically saying, hey, on the subreddit, this guy has been given a special before he should be ever given a special. He doesn't deserve a special. He's not funny enough. Like, he hasn't been doing it long enough. Doesn't have to do open mics, early performance in front of his own fans. It's insane. Why has he got a special now? He shouldn't have one. And the retort you kept getting back from comedians was like, you were getting hating, hating, hating. He's good, he's good, he's good. Like, just kind of like the refusal to admit that that special was given to him too soon, the Showtime special. But the worst thing of that was that in the end, Brendan knew that to be true because he, you know, later on down the line, he revealed the fact that his own close friends told him not to take the fucking deal from Showtime. They said, don't do it. But he did it anyway because he thought his friends were hating. So this guy that everyone was trying to talk sense into and appeal to his better nature and appeal to his common sense, he was already lost. Brendan was already deluded and big headed and didn't think he did anything wrong. And I'm a great guy. I'm a nice guy. The best of the guy, the piece of dad. He already thought that from back then when you'd be surprised came out so if anything the, f the fact that he's got more fame and more money he's actually a worse version of himself than he was prior then because he's way more further down his career so it's just annoying that this same guy as well again the other day when it was, i think it was john burn john burnfall right the guy that did um i forgot anyway the, you know the actor he's sitting down with him and they're waxing lyrical about printing he's a great guy it's just like and trying to basically say that they don't understand the hate he gets and i think if you're a comedy fan if you're a comedy purist and you see someone like Brendan getting a Showtime special after two years in comedy and you know the guy's not funny, you watch the special, it's absolutely trash, you're allowed to be annoyed by it and you're allowed maybe to be annoyed by him for not being willing to understand why people will probably hate on the special and hate on him because they think he doesn't deserve it, he shouldn't have got it and when he did the final product, he wasted everyone's time and it was absolutely terrible. Like, that's the one thing and people didn't want to admit it and only now later down the line, that's why we have to thank, we have to thank him. We have to thank Andy Liederman we got to thank Kalila. We've got to thank Esther. Um, we've got to thank all these people, maybe even Uniques, right, for leaking that picture, that video of him giving that girl her number, allegedly. We've got to thank all these people because without them kind of breaking that wall down of like, okay, let's, let, of like openly dissing these people, no one would have been brave enough to say these things because when Brendan was Joe Rogan's best friend and Joe Rogan was still living in LA, no one would have said this. Everyone would have been like, you know, kind of pretending it's not happening, mute, and just leaving it. But the fact that those girls stood up and said what they said and kind of, in a way, maybe risked their careers for it, especially Annie, if you believe what people say about her not being, about her being banned from Joe Rogan uh, podcast and shit for her revealing the truck walk story. If that's the case, those girls deserve a lot of credit because they not only exposed, you know, those guys, but also kind of let it be, you know, turn the tide in terms of comfortability for everyone to kind of speak openly about dissing those people and tease them and saying whatever they want to say but i just find it hilarious coming from um joey diaz because this has always been the case he kind of talks out of both sides of his mouth when it comes to brendan on one side he kind of find it hard to criticize because i guess it's joe rogan's friend and maybe he likes brendan too but on the other side he even said himself i think he went on the fire and the kid once didn't he remember that does that does that clip of joey diaz with brendan where he said he didn't talk to him for a while because he didn't like that he took stand-up. He thought, ah, oh, he was going to be shit or something. It's some weird clip. Do you remember this clip? Where is it? 
Like, it's so he, it's interesting that he defends him, then takes the piss out of him, then defends and takes the piss out of him. It's fucking bizarre. Let me see if I can get it on here. Yeah, there we go. No, that's not the one. That's not the one. Where is it? Uh, where is he? Uh, it's where he sits down with him on the fire and the kid. That's the one, right? Yeah, this is the one, yeah. Joe Diaz explains to Brendan Shaw why he didn't like him doing comedy. This is something that he did to Brendan face to face. Like, this is probably quite bad. I compare comedy to MMA every fucking day. How so? My comedy changed since I became a fan of MMA mm -hmm. because there's so many aspects that go into MMA. The same way of so many aspects that go into comedy. Let's take the elephant out of the room. <laughs> I've always loved you. Yeah. I've always loved you. I've had a great <laughs> Anytime someone says something like that, especially an older dude, you know it's going to be some like, you know, some not so nice things are going to come out here. Some brutally honest things. Let's take the elephant out of the room. Let's take the elephant out of the room. You know, I've always loved you. You know, I've always cared about you. Right? But you're a fanook. You're a manuku. You're a... <laughs> Let's do this. Great respect for you. You get punched in the fucking head. Not a lot of people could get punched in the head. You decided one day you didn't want to do this. Mm -hmm. You didn't want to fight no more. You didn't see the, you didn't see it anymore. You oh, look, Brendan's got that little twitch. I recognize. He's still got that that trick, that twitch he still does, where he kind of like bites the side of his mouth when he gets nervous, when he's feeling a little bit, you know, a little bit awkward, a little bit put into a corner. What you had, but he's you but you know he's way more skinnier here, and he looks so such in better shape. You can tell him from his legs, from his arms. This is definitely a, a, the face of a guy that doesn't drink a lot of whiskey. Like you know, even he's he even he's flipping um what you call it? What they swing called again? A man bun thing. His little ponytail looks a lot better here. Look how chiseled his face looks. Look at that. No no uh no bunch of, no what you call it? Um no stung by bees in his face. He legitimately looks like an ex fighter, right? That you'd imagine, right? Someone in quite good nick. Top of the shape of his legs, even alone. Now all of his trousers have elastic on them, so you can tell. You know, when when you, when you start switching from having trousers with the bottom fly to elastic, that's when you know you're creeping over the fat world. Trust me, I've been there. Let's, let's play. First started, you know. Sometimes people look behind the curtain or something, and it changes. Yeah. You know, I hate the the business of stand up. Mm -hmm. I fucking hate the business of stand up. Mm -hmm. I hate the business of stand up. Mm -hmm. But I love stand-up comedy, yeah. so I'm caught in a... So I figured out how to avoid all those <laughs> things that I don't like from stand-up <laughs> comedy, the that. egos and stuff Thank like you. that. What's he going to say? You got out of it. You started a podcast. It became very successful. One day I'm going through fucking Facebook, and I see that fucking Brendan Schaub's doing stand-up at the store, and I go, no. <laughs> A conversation he wants to have on air. It's like it's brutal, isn't it? He's having these conversations with these people he considers to be peers and mentors and shit. And one in Joe Rogan got him to quit his career, right? Cancel flipping UFC. Give it up. You're never going to be champion. On live on air on Joe Rogan. Like, imagine how embarrassing that must have been at the time it happened. Like, it's meant to be a good friend. And then now you've got another guy out here sitting you down one to one and saying, I never went to stand up. I'm like, oh my God. What's this Momo doing stand up? Oh my God. You know, like, you're like, <laughs> you can't take it. Oh, let's keep playing. I go, why is he doing this? I, I, I don't want him, you know, in my heart, I'm like, and I wasn't hating. No, but yeah. I just didn't know what you were going to go up there and talk Protective, about. Protective, man, yeah. <laughs> I avoided Protective. You. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I didn't say a fucking word. I, I can't. I don't want to be put in a position where Brendan comes up to me and asks me, what do I think? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, he's my brother. The other day, I fucking... <laughs> so basically, he told him from then on that he didn't think it was funny because it wasn't like he said, oh, you're, you're actually really good. He just said, I didn't want to be put in that position. You know, Ari's gone. So I called Eric and I go, Eric, do you mind if I host? Ari wrote me a letter. And he goes, I want you to watch. And, and you know, so the other night when I went to that storytelling show, so this is what this happened. is not happening. Yeah. I was sitting there as Joey Diaz, but in my mind, I was Ari. And I would go up to Ari afterward and go, what do you think of that story? And he'd go... And he's talking about this. That's not a story. That's a bit, you know. And I compare. You were a little cold to me even when I came in. Oh yeah, I was. I knew so. I even I text I Rogan like, and Brian. I'm like, dude, did I do something to Joe? Oh, look at. 
I go, God before this, it. like d- weeks before. I go, God damn it. So Rogan has always been daddy. Oh, daddy Rogan, that meme that people keep posting on flipping the Fire and the Kids subreddit, it's got some legs to it. Daddy Rogan was always Daddy Rogan. Brendan, Rogan, eh, did I do something to piss off Jerry Diaz? He didn't say hi to me at the comedy store. He didn't give me an edible like he usually does. Like, what? These guys, grown men with children, with wives at home, with mortgages, with kids in school, with family they're looking after, texting another man about their relationship with another man. Like, are you insane? Just text the guy himself, in it. See what's the deal. God almighty. Listen. You're a fighter. You've had dirty fights. You said on stage the other day. Uh, I've had a bunch. Yes, dirty fights. Yeah. Okay. Amateur. Box what if? And all what that. if tomorrow I got my blue belt, and you were happy for me, and then two weeks later you saw a picture of me on Twitter at the boxing gym <laughs> on Sunset with my fat little gut, and all of a sudden, exactly. a month later, you saw Joey go into a smoker. Yeah. And for some reason, Joey goes five and zero. Oh. Yeah. He, he arm bars one guy or yeah. Camorism with his weight. The other guy was a lucky punch. You know what those smokers, not everybody's yeah. ready for MMA and for maybe sure. I'm better. I go 5-0. and oh. One day I bump into you and I got the balls to tell you, bro, I'm quitting stand-up. I talked to Dana. He's going to give me a fight against. You're going to look at me and go, Jesus, Joey, you're a good stand-up. Why are you doing this? I get it, man. So when all this is going He doesn't get it, though. He doesn't. And he admitted it later on. He doesn't get it because at this time, he admitted with his own fucking voice, this guy is awful, isn't it, as this person. He legitimately thought when Joe Rogan and Brian Callen told him not to take the Showtime deal, that they were hating on him because he got the deal so quick in, in his career. Because he legitimately thought that he was... He he must have felt... Because this is the thing. is I, I, I have some sympathy with Brendan. Because if you follow Brendan's story, he's always been the... What's it called? Uh, what's that? What's that? What's that phrase people use? When you're the bridesmaid and not the bride, right? Is that the phrase? Something along those kind of lines. He's always been that kind of guy. So he's had people around him. He's always been successful in the fields that they want to be success in. Whether it's lacrosse professionally, whether it's flipping football, UFC. He's always the one that's been last yeah, last picked, whatever it may be. Right? Strength coiler. Those are the things that he's kind of been. But also, he's always kind of failed. Just when he kind of is on the cusp of doing something, never works out. Like his football career. Say what you want about his football career, whether he did it or not. He did get to some level, but not the level he wanted to get to. He didn't sign for an NFL team. He was on a practice squad. He made it a walk-on. He made a cup of coffee, whatever. Didn't really get to as far as he wanted to get to. UFC, the same thing. Even though it's delusional because his skill set wasn't good enough, he actually went in there with the intention of being a champion. He thought he could be UFC champion. It didn't work out. Yeah? He kind of got embarrassed a little bit and then basically, you know, essentially caught left, basically. Then he gets into stand-up or podcasting and stand-up. Podcasting goes really well really quickly. So he thinks, oh, this, I finally find my thing because it's coming easy. Then stand up, he tries it and it be- and it becomes easy too. He's getting booked everywhere. He's getting invited on different shows. I'm not surprised, personally. I'm not surprised that Brendan had that level of ego at that time. It makes a lot of sense to me, personally, because it was the first time in his life he's ever got some kind of positive affirmation reaction from the universe that he's on the right path because sometimes it's hard to figure out am i actually doing the thing i should be doing like sometimes even with the djing stuff you're, you're you're chasing this dream with the djing and that like i'm doing it at the moment and sometimes you can look at yourself and think of why am i doing these things like who cares about me dj who gives a fuck but then you maybe think in the back of your head also you never know this one stream i do could be the one stream that somebody at some club sees and it suddenly kind of takes you to the way you need to get to but imagine the opposite Imagine if you're Brendan and the first DJ stream you put out, somebody from fucking, I don't know, one of, I don't know, fucking Avicii's guys calls you up and says, hey, do you want to come on tour? Right? One of David Getter guys says, hey, do you want to help out on an album? Like suddenly, like from the first record you put out, from the first stream you put out, it would maybe make you think you're better than what you are, but maybe he, he got you because he thinks you're funny because he likes the fact that you've got your own inbuilt audience, because you're going to probably sell tickets or whatever it may be. There may be other reasons tied to have a part of your skill, but because you get fast-tracked, it kind of gives you a delusion, a kind of a, a warped sense of where you're actually at. You don't really realize where you're actually at because your levels of your bookings are going to such a level that it doesn't make sense. Like He was probably booking 200 to 500 cap venues. He's probably selling them out at this level. Being two years in, having crappy jokes, 
he was already selling out 500 cap venues and some legit stand-ups were struggling to fill out 250 seats so it's no surprise that he turned into a bit of a monster in my opinion no surprise really going down i'm like why is this happening i like him on the podcast i'm sitting there and you went on stage exactly Koyla. he's like carl cox putting on his cat dealer to open exactly exactly and if i'm not mistaken actually one of those guys i think it's um what's his name oh jamie jones i think one of jamie jones's guys yeah that's a story the, the the rumor is jamie jones this really popular house dj um one of these people that he kind of works with and then his label and somebody kind of mentored and brought up called richie ahmed he originally was their dealer he was like the guy that used to sell them pills and shit and then you know at one after hours he just started playing and started hanging out with them and then they decided to bring him on tour because he was also you know their, their dealer allegedly and he could also dj so it kind of you know killed two birds with one stone they didn't have to use the dealers the, the sorry the, the the opening djs from the promoters they could bring their own guy and also he could maybe provide the party packs and that's how he got started into djing so it kind of does happen a lot but obviously richard Ahmed is far He's improved over the years. He's got a lot better. But when he first started, he wasn't great. But he was getting booked to all these amazing venues in Ibiza and shit that made it look like he was a legit DJ when he wasn't. And more and more, every fucking two minutes, I fell in love with you more. I thought you were going to go up there and tell a story about UFC pussy and fucking protein stinky pussy <laughs> or something. It was completely different. You told a fucking very touching story of your heart and what your goals were, and you had it set up. You had the so tags in the perfect place. You talked about, you know, I said it's funny things though. that I've always laughed about. Talk like, about, talk about, talk this about. This is why I don't go to sport funny. games. Because you got to walk in with a jersey. What if that team loses? you got to take the train all the way home in New York with a Met shirt on like a <laughs> fucking asshole. Yeah, people don't think about it. Yo, I can't imagine being on the losing end of a fight and walking out holding your stuff. They never <laughs> even show it. Only once when Aldo lost. Dana White made sure that camera was yeah, an Aldo. Yeah. They had him in the bathroom crying. It's humiliating. It's man. humiliating. It's fucking humiliating. You describe it, and you put me there. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, oh, my God. Nothing funny, though. You know, I could never fucking do this, what he Nothing did. funny. Yeah. And you went, and I left there that night blown away. Like, I Anything went funny? home and sat in the living room, and I said, talent is talent. I'm such an asshole for thinking that. I thought, I've had a lot of people who have just gotten into stand-up, and then after they've done it a year, they've actually come up. He said he was talented. To be fair to him, though, to be fair, he is talking about the Brendan Schaub story that he did on Irish Affairs thing, right? That was really good. That might be actually Brendan's best comedic content online. That story he told. There's a lot of holes in it and some of it obviously isn't true. But that story was pretty tight. And if I remember correctly, that story was punched up and was tweaked by Bert Kreischer. But that's when Brendan and Bert were quite close still. But he used to kind of lean in for help and obviously because it was more of a story type comedic, com comedic um, comedian. So that maybe makes sense because that's what Joey Diaz saw. So the first thing that Joey Diaz saw was um that story time thing that he did so it makes sense why he fought there the you know the guy's funny i get it i kind of get it up to me and put their chest up to me like said like bro i'm going to montreal and it took me a year and in my mind i won't wish him no evil but i'll go this motherfucker yeah has no idea he has no idea He's going to go up there and bomb when mm -hmm. he sees the big lights. It's like fighting in smokers. For sure. And then I'm in Vegas, bitch. And even though I'm 5-0 and oh and I got a great right hand. Different angle. And I got a great jujitsu game, my guard is tight. Let me tell you something. The lights, the people, that's a complete different ball game. You know, yeah. I almost shit my pants at the Wilton Theater. I've been doing comedy 26 fucking years. I went out to the Wilton Theater. I looked up. I saw all those people. I had to stop for two <laughs> seconds, bro. My legs went out from under me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So... When you did that the other night, I went home and I slept a couple hours. And when I woke you, I called you right in the morning. Yeah, you did. And I go, dog, what I saw last night blew me away. It gave me hope. Yeah, man. Because you told a story. You know, Ari has a big problem between a bit and a story. There's a big difference between a bit and a fucking story. Big difference. Big difference. And you saw it that night. A bit's great. You could do a bit and it's great. And it's probably true. What you're telling me, it's probably true. But it's not a story. There's condemnation in your voice and different things in the story and you have to take me I have to see you you, yeah, man. you made me saw you on the floor I almost fainted thinking about the booger 
and the red blood all on the floor while yeah. you were grobbering. Yeah. So you took me for a psychological journey, and that psychological journey was so good that it made me drive to Playa Del Rey to see my brother yes. and give him props You're like the best, a motherfucker. Man.